were uh, talking about his his like Netflix series or his certain comedic episodes that were going to be on Spike. And I said, you know, funniest man in the world. He goes, no, you know, no, I'm not. You, no, I'm not. And I go, no, you're not. But, you know, and we laughed, right? And that was true, full on, like, Joe, you're the funniest man I ever met. No, I'm not. No, you're right, Joe, you're not. But, you know, I'm just trying to help, you know, pimp your, your comedy special coming up on Spike or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, the whole, uh, you're a very funny man. No, Goldie, you're a very funny man. Or the Japanese one. Why? I don't, they're speaking Japanese. You're the one married to a half Japanese woman. Why? You should know that. Like, okay, Tomo Rigato. I, I, I don't know, right? <laughs> so, yeah, th those are epic. They're fun. They're funny. And it just shows how Joe and our relationship really was pure. Because they always say in sports, Nate, that, you know, you want to be like the, like the commentators. You want them to be the, the two dudes at the end of the bar watching the fight with you, but talking about it. And when Joe and I were having fun like that, that was the true, like, bring another, you know, bring another couple jammies because, you know, we're having fun talking about these fights and everybody's having fun taking them in with us. And that's always how we felt. Yeah. No, I, you, you could see it as well, the chemistry on screen. Like, yeah. I think it's different as well with, like, the UFC has, like, changed commentators for the better, I think, because... Yeah. I, my sports that I watch would be boxing, uh, MMA, and I would also watch soccer as well, football here. And sure. Um, and before, whenever I was younger, the commentators were always just like very professional, especially boxing. Boxing it's like it's like a very um, prestige sport that needs to be yes. um, very buttoned commentated. up old school. Yeah, yeah like yeah. eloquently, it needs to be make sure that there's no like um, like derogatory terms or like slang or anything like that there. But then whenever you and Joe came in, it was like just like a breath of fresh air and it was kind of like it changed the game and now you can see it with like the likes sure. of Daniel and Joe and John now as well like you can see their yeah, yeah. their chemistry coming together but obviously I'm still always a Goldie and Rogan yeah, fan I uh, <laughs> yeah just throw yeah. that out there but yeah. um I definitely think he's did you, you sort of use what are the watershed moment to like the change sure. that yeah and and you know back in the day it was you know tuxedo bow tie you know there's a big boxing match like let's make sure we're extremely polished and this is like going to the prom um and you can't say anything bad about your date as you went to the prom or anybody's dates if you will uh not that it wasn't i guess not that it wasn't proper if you will at the time for them to handle boxing like that but going back to me talking about my partner on bare knuckle boxing and it's Top Box TV, which comes out in 2022. Um, Pauli Malinadji was one of the guys who changed the game in the way that the sport of boxing, the sweet science is commentated. And Pauli has that renegade Joe approach and sitting next to a guy who would better fit what you just described in Al Bernstein, it was a great mix. It was a great mix because you had that. You had Al, but then you had Pauli. And so, you know, it's like point counterpoint back uh, way before you're born Saturday Night Live, you know, uh, Jane, you ignorant slut. Like they would always say, and that's <laughs> a phrase from Saturday Night Live people. So don't get, you know, or the office, the, Michael that, or the it. office. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. See, uh, there you go. Now we've come together. Yeah. In age. Um, yeah. And, and that's the way to, that's the way it works. And um, so that that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. Yeah. And much to your point, it's about entertaining, too. And um I've always said I'm always about the two F's, the fighters and the fans. I am there to represent the fighters properly. I'm going to do my homework. You can tell me, you know, oh, you're just going to another Michael Bisping fight. Bullshit. No, Michael Bisping fight five, fight 13, fight 18, obviously fight 27 when he knocked out Luke. Michael evolved just like every human being does every single day. So to say, oh, you're just calling another BJ Penn. No. What has BJ done differently? What has BJ done the same? What is BJ going to do tonight? How do his skills match up with tonight's opponent? So I was always about representing the fighters with the commitment that they deserve. And I always tell people, Nate, if you were the making your debut, in the UFC belt, whatever it was, you've worked a decade at least getting yeah. your butt kicked, training your ass off to get to that level. And I can't spend a couple hours checking out your background, talking to your coaches, interviewing you and getting the right story. If mm -hmm. That would be so disrespectful to any fighter. But to someone who's a rookie, if you will, 
they'd say, oh, I, you know, you don't have to know much about them. They're in and out. Bullshit. No, they're as important as the two fighters in our main event tonight because yeah. they put in as much work. And they're not at that point now. So they're really fighting for a living. It's where some of the other fighters are established and they've started to make a great living doing it. And mm -hmm. then the fans, of course. And it's to entertain the fans and get you guys excited and have you have fun. If it's, you know, our energy or if it's our, you know, true side of just being human. Funny, uh, even when we're trying not to be, as, as I did more than once. <laughs> um, that was what it's all about. And, and when I talk to fighters uh, continuing through the present time, I get that reaction from every single fighter. And that means so much to me that Goldie, you always, you always did me right. You always did me right. You always did your homework. You always did me right. And I appreciate how devoted you were to the sport and how devoted you continue to be to the sport. Anthony Pettis and I just saw each other at the PFL championships a little over a month ago and showtime and i go all the way back to the beginning of his showtime yeah. run and he just goldie man you, you're you're a legend like okay you're kind of a legend showtime but when when those people say that to you that is really what it's all about what it's all about yeah. uriah hall was at a lfa in phoenix and pulled me aside it was after i'd left the ufc he goes you have no idea how much you missed and i always had a good relationship with uriah but for him to make that point, to take that extra time, not to say, what up, Goldie, great to see you, I miss you. Come down, find me, talk to me and say, you got to listen to me for a sec, bud. You are missed so much. That, that's the best thing that people can say. That's the best thing that yeah. fans can say. And uh, it just means that I've been doing it right. And I'm going to continue to try to do it right until I'm done doing it. Yeah, definitely. And you, you had just mentioned there as well, like some of the funny things that like, yeah, you had said, um, Obviously, that's very sweet as well. Like these fighters, like yeah, people think yeah. that UFC fighters, you, like you were talking about before, like you were trying to establish that like this is a professional sport, it's not just two yeah. guys off the street coming in. Like these guys actually have feelings and like everyone always assumes that these UFC fighters are, they don't have a heart and all, but like you just mentioned there, Uriah, obviously it's it's sweet that they say that. Um, one of my favorite things that you ever say is your catchphrase. Do you know what I'm about to say? What your catchphrase is? Do you even know you have one? Oh, well, of course I do. I have a, a handful. So I'm trying to figure out which one you're going to go to. I, are you going to go to virtually identical? <laughs> yeah. Were you? Oh, you yeah. got Robert Downey Jr. done virtually doing? identical. I don't know <laughs> why that or came up, but there it is, you know, <laughs> our nice tale of the tape for <laughs> tonight's main event of the evening. Mike Goldberg about to be 57 years old. Nate, how old are you? I'm uh, 26. Uh, Nate is 26. Everything else is virtually identical. Here's Bruce Popper. <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant. There it is for you, buddy. I've got there shivers. I've got shivers. Uh, that was amazing. Thanks for that's doing that. That's funny. No, Do you know what course. you're like? Do you know what you're like with, whenever you say that? Do you know the EA Sports sure. guy? Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. EA yeah. Sports. That's kind of what you're yeah. EA like. EA Sports. It's in the game. Yeah, yeah. that's what it's yeah. like whenever you say yeah. virtually identical. I there you go. Well, that's a compliment too, because they've uh, yeah. pumped out some great games, and I got to work with them for many years. And yeah, man, that is a uh, that task was was a mighty one, because of all the different takes you have to do. But yeah, I could imagine. Then, you know, then you're on a video game, and your son's playing in the other room. You're like, whoa, that's kind of cool. That's kind of epic. <laughs> yeah. That that's that's legendary. So um, yeah, to to be like the EA Sports it's in the game yeah. is uh, kind of cool. Kind of it is here we go like, it's all over it's it, it all just kind of happened mate i didn't yeah. i didn't go in saying oh, i gotta come up with something i need yeah. a, a shtick i need to have something to separate me from the others i said it one time if it's it's all over and i said it again and then i watched the show back and i'm like wow that that sounded kind of cool then fans started reacting to it fighters started yeah. reacting to it and the, here we go the same and then I was like, all right, I'm on to something. But it it came as just something that I said on the air in a certain show that yeah. caught fire, as opposed to the other way around. Like, I got to try this one. I'm going to try that one. Which catch phrase is going to stick? Like, let's throw them on the wall and see what happens. Um, yeah. Because, you know, let's get ready to rumble. There's only, you know, one guy who can do that properly. And so, like, <laughs> I, I, yeah, having something like that, 
like, like Michael have now, you know, Bruce, obviously it's time and, yeah. and, you know, different people do different things in their job that you see that's kind of their thing. Mine just developed over time. And I remember my first Bellator, it was at Madison Square Garden. Michael Chandler uh, fought for the title that night. That was when he got the dead leg. Um, and I hadn't met Michael before that. And when I did, he looks at me, he goes, Goldie, welcome. This is going to be awesome. I am finally going to get to hear, it is all over in one of my fights. Now, <sighs> we laugh about it later. It was supposed to be Brent Primus that I was talking about. Um, but yeah, Michael and I, for Michael to say that, like all these years I've been in it, I just wanted to hear you say, it is all over, uh, you know, during <laughs> one of my fights. And then his last fight in Bellator, obviously I got to get a good one in. And as I walked out, he was doing the press conference and I was just like, it is all over. He's like, just like that. So yeah, it's, <laughs> it's cool that the fighters like it too. It's cool that fighters yeah. like it too. That's sick. Yeah. I like, I'm not even joking. Like see this whole conversation I've been talking to you. It's been very comfortable on um, I haven't like got like all like nerdy about um, obviously you being <laughs> like one of the, like my heroes when I was growing up, and uh, whenever you said that, I was just like, holy shit, that's happening, <laughs> right, right, and yeah. and that was how it is too. Like here we go, and and even like how I do the tail of the tape or yeah. tail of the tape for I just did it one time, and coming up next, coming up next. I remember like hanging with Kenny Florian years ago in Boston. I was doing the UFC. He was fighting in the UFC, but I was also doing ACC basketball. So I was up doing a show for the Atlantic Coast Conference for college hoops at Boston College, which is where Kenny went to school. So Kenny came up, picked me up after the show. We went out, had some dinner, had some cocktails, had some laughs. And he and his brother, Keith, kept going, coming up next, coming <laughs> up next. I'm like... <laughs> All right, I guess that's how I'm going to say coming up next. So that it's is, fun. It's fun that people rock it. It's pretty cool. Yeah, pretty cool. I love that. I love it. I, I think it's amazing. <laughs> I'm so happy that you've said it tonight as well. Thank you. Um, we're two for two on the Robert Downey Jr. and the virtually identical. Like we're, I know, boom. I know. See? We're great. like, you and I are like Joe and I were because we didn't rehearse this as much as people might think we did. Yeah. We're just uh, virtually identical is what we are. <laughs> yeah. And we're just talking. That's what I mean. That's like, what it's about. Like what you said about like uh, doing the research and about your like obviously I didn't like I knew who you were and I, I remember sure. like a lot of things like obviously following your career but like um for me growing as well like I've been doing what you said as well like you, you go in and you re research who, who your guest sure. is and um I think that's the best way to go because then you can bring up things like like I brought up the Robert Downey Jr. thing and yeah. like you said you had a moment with your family as well like yeah just, like kind of small things like it's nice and then we can build our chemistry up. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that, that, that that's important. Um, I've got a few questions left in my mind and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, and at the very end, I'm going to get you to say it's all over because I think I'll be class. Yeah, of course. Um, of course. What was your favorite fight to, to commentate that? You know, I always get asked that and I can never bring it down and just say there is one because mm -hmm. That would be impossible because there were favorites in different ways. I mean, I mentioned Gilbert Melendez, Diego Sanchez earlier. And Chandler and Gaethje just put on a similar show. That obviously goes down as one of my favorite fights. Hendo Shogun. I mean, 25 minutes of war twice. Um, I think the first one was a five rounder, but it, all I know is that they battled. Yeah, it was because in the fifth, Shogun had Dan mounted the whole time in the first fight. And he was so freaking tired. He couldn't do anything. Dan couldn't get up off bottom. But, it, you know, they were both spent and uh, the wars that they went into. Uh, every fight Anderson Silva took part in was one that I got excited for because that dude just did things that nobody else in the world yeah. did inside the octagon. And, uh, you know, I, Vitor is one of my favorite. And when he kicked Vitor in the face, I'm like, whoa. Yeah, that was crazy. What happened here? Like, yeah. And then different places. Like, hard for me to say there's any better place in Dublin to call a fight. And there are a great place don't, anywhere in the UK we went. I mean, when Bisping fought at home, right after he had won the title at UFC 199, when he knocked out Rockhold, oh, yeah. that was epic. That was crazy. We started really late because we kept it on, you know, US time, if you will, for the pay-per-view. Yeah. Um, the way that, I, I think sometimes Connor's weigh-ins were <laughs> not more enjoyable than the fights, but they were equally epic because all of a sudden <laughs> we'd be in these weigh-in situations and you, they're oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, and it's like 
a bunch of drunk Irish people. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Of course. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it, I, I'm like, are we in Vegas or are we in Dublin? Are we in Madison square garden or like, are we truly like at the O2 arena or at, you know, three arena in Dublin? Like where, where are we right now? Cause I feel like we are basically right in the middle of Ireland because mm. Connor traveled so well. Um, and then 80,000 at Skydome was obviously very, very special. Um, I always talk about Rampage, Vanderlei, people like that, whatever Rampage was getting set to come into the octagon or in Bellator, same with Vanderlei. I was just like, whoa, man, mm. it, something could blow up, blow up. And I'd always be like, oh, let's go, let's go with Vanderlei. And so, I mean, that, that is, uh, that's enjoyable. And, um, you know, Edson Barboza, Terry Adam, uh, that was scary, crazy. Yeah, Ronda that beating, was bad you know? Oh, that was like vicious, vicious, like yeah. the spinning heel kick. Um, so it's hard to pinpoint one, but as you can relate to, you can say, I get excited for the fighters that were exciting and put on crazy, crazy shows and crazy competitions. And I loved the venues that were the most passionate. And mm. that's really what, the, and they were like, I always talk to people about MMA, but UFC fans, you know, back in the day, I said, there's no shallow end of the pool. When you talk about a fan of MMA or a fan of the UFC. They, nobody dips their toe in it, as you know, Nate, and goes, oh, oh, into it. But no, it's either I have no idea what it is or, oh, fuck, yeah, I'm 100 percent in. Yeah. Or it's I have no idea what it is. But my brother in law, he talks about it all the time. He won't stop talking about it. So you, you're one removed from somebody going off the high dive. That's yeah. what made my job so much fun is how much the fans were into it and are into it. And I, you know, it got me a little, you know got me a little beat up on social media from time to time, but that's all right. That's all good. Yeah. Um, and that's truly what it is, that passion. And honestly, the UFC 199, Bisping knocking out Luke Rockhold. And yeah. but one of the most epic nights of my career and one of the most, you know, dynamic knockouts and finishes and storylines of Michael waiting so long to get that opportunity and then only getting it because someone else couldn't fight and taking advantage of it. My boy, JP, Jason Prillo going like behind him. It's just like, it's just epic. So it's, uh, it's, it's been a brilliant ride. And like I said, it's far from over and it's the ones who go out and do those spectacular things. And I react the same way as the fans do. The, yeah. If I asked you, what were your favorite fights? I would probably say agree, 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 and agree because those are the <laughs> ones that, that got Joe and I all excited as well. Yeah, that's so true. And like, even whenever you were saying about like um, UFC fans like dipping their toe in, I remember the, the only reason why I started watching UFC, I was watching WWE and then uh, my friend was like, oh, I've started playing this UFC game. And then I was just like, oh, what's that? And then he was just like, oh, well, basically it's this here and he showed me and he's like, yeah, but Brock Lesnar's in it. And I was just like, really? And then I watched my first ever UFC. I always remember I stayed up late and I watched Brock Lesnar against Frank Mir. And then I just fell in love with the sport. I was just like, oh my God, this is amazing. I need to keep watching it. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's crazy because of the time change. So you had to be a true passionate fan and stay up all (laughs) night or in the middle of the morning to watch those fights. Um, It's funny. I've got the poster of UFC 91 in my office here, Brock and Randy, because that was my 100th UFC. 91 oh, wow. like, but we had all those shows on spike yeah, and everything right, yeah so my 100th ufc was ufc 91 uh brock and randy and uh we had a party afterwards and sure enough randy showed up he was a little beat up but my buddy <laughs> the natural randy couture showed up to uh celebrate my 100th with me nate and uh, my first ufc ultimate japan was when randy became the heavyweight champion beating maurice smith so my my bond with the natural is mm-hmm. uh is one that is unbreakable as well unbreakable and i suppose the like sort of thing that i I want i always like start i know we're kind of going backwards chronologically here but um i would be annoyed if i didn't ask you how did you actually get involved into the ufc like what did you sort of grind it out to do (laughs) just like honestly i just at the right place at the right time and it took a lot of years to to find out that we actually were in the right place at the right time um, Concom, you, you've heard that name before, Connell Communications. 
CONCOM has had the production rights, if you will, and they've worked with the UFC for decades. Um, Bruce Connell, who was the producer for two decades, Bruce, he passed away. It's going to be, wow, four years, passed away at 61 years old. He's like my best friend, like broke my freaking heart. And it does every time I talk about it. But I mean, I, I, you remember Joe talking about it. I talked about it. I, Bruce, Bruce and I had a bond that was like, I talk about what Joe and I had. You got to have producer and your play-by-play -play guy on a certain like wavelength anyway. So basically I'm the quarterback. He's the offensive coordinator. He's the boss, but we got to be, we got to be on the same game plan. And mm -hmm. Brucey and I were on the same game plan. Um, and I'd say all the time tonight's show produced by Bruce Connell directed by Anthony Pasquale Giordano. Um, but back in the nineties, I was doing the NHL on ESPN. Bruce's father, Scotty is on the Mount Rushmore of ESPN. He was one of the first people who got ESPN started and the 24 hour entertainment sports programming network. So fast forward to the nineties and Brucey is one of my producers for ESPN hockey. And we got along great. We had beers. We're both hockey players and we had a blast. And he was teaching me TV every time I got a chance to work with him. Bruce Beck was doing the UFC up to that point. Bruce was freelancing in and out of New York. I was doing a lot like in sports channel, Chicago, I would work the bull sidelines and then I would work big college basketball games and then the UFC. And then I went to ESPN. Well, Bruce Beck got the main, co the main weekend anchoring gig at NBC in New York. So he could no longer freelance, which mean the UFC needed a new announcer. And I've done this one many times. And he golly, 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 golly. I got a gig for you. It's in Japan. You got to take a jiu-jitsu class. Like, <laughs> fuck all, all I heard is fucking like Japan. So let's go. And yeah. uh, the rest is history. But it was mine and Bruce's relationship in hockey. Um, the fact that he knew that I was a passionate broadcaster and he knew that I would do my homework in a new sport. And at that time, again, Nate, we didn't know where it was going in 97. That was the dark days. That was the human cockfighting era from, you know, Senator John McCain, may he rest in peace. And, and really, when you look back at it, he really wasn't that far off in, you know, the way that he talked about it, because when the UFC and MMA became a worldwide sensation and a mainstream sport was by taking what he had said years prior, listening to those words and, and like, introducing the world to the true competitors, the true athletes, the sportsmanship, the mentality of fighters who don't fight in the street, they fight in a combat zone for a living. And that's very different than I think the, it's very different than the UFC was at the beginning because it was designed as two men will enter the octagon, only one will leave. <laughs> um, but it, it took all of that to, to make it happen. And Bruce and I were on that ride, uh, same way same way as what I said before. And it, it's funny, like I said, Brucey has uh, tragically been gone for a few years, but that night with all the jammies and the place eating those crazy sandwiches that John told us um, to find, I was with Bruce's wife, Karen, and his son, Tyler. Uh, Tyler was on the Bellator crew with me for years. And so, you know, making the story come full circle, I was there with my Connell family that night. Nice. Uh, but Brucey got me into it. It was a fluke. He thought I had passion, thought I had a little personality, a little energy. And uh, the rest is uh, the rest is history, and, and a great uh, two decades of doing something that I absolutely loved. That's amazing. And when I say loved, I talk about the UFC, not the sport. Obviously, yeah. uh, a time in which was uh, we were we had the best jobs in the world, no question about it. I love that story. It just like it just happened. Like it was just absolutely you were just like Japan. Let's go. Like uh, yeah, that's yeah. just amazing right? the way things just work out. And it was uh, again we had three or four years together during the SCG days before the Fertitas came in, bought the UFC and started to change everything. And Brucey and I, after every show, be like, all right, you want one more? Yeah, we might want to have one more because I don't know if we got another show. I hear they're running out of money. whatever it was. And I give Bob Barrowitz huge props because he kept it going long enough to get it over to the hands of Frank and Lorenzo and then Dana and that leadership. And now the sport is what it is today um, and the organization is, but the sport, is what it is around the world today. Um, but yeah, we were uncertain each show if we were gonna have another one uh, for a couple of years there when we weren't on cable and everything was regulated much more tightly and uh, not accepted by the mainstream the way it is, you know, present day. Yeah, of course. And it's lovely, it's lovely for you to like, obviously tell that story as well about the, the relationship that you had. 
Um, and you still have the relationship with um, his son Tyler as well today. Yeah, um, yeah. To this day and, and Carly reason. and Trevor and yeah, it, it, and I don't mean to interrupt, but I wasn't going to leave the rest of the Connell family out. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, it's just in, in Tyler. My relationship is 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 it's crazy because I think in a lot of ways, I well, I know in a lot of ways that Tyler keeps Bruce's spirit alive in me, and I keep. Bruce's spirit alive for Tyler because we talk so much about my time with Bruce, Brucey, 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 this story, that story. And Tyler is 33 years old, 32, 33. So he was just a kid when his father and I were doing all kinds of dumb shit all around the world and doing a lot of great TV. And he's, he's in the family business as well. And uh, Tyler and I picked up and uh, we always do Brucey proud during the show and after the show, we always do Brucey proud and uh, Tyler Connell and the entire Connell family is my family forever. And that will never change. That will never change. Brucey's number, Brucey's the best producer I ever worked with and no disrespect to anybody I've worked with in addition. Well, buddy, John Norton is a rock star. He was the UFC for years at Bellator. I've had other great producers, but there'll never be another Brucey. Never be another Brucey when it comes to me. Never. Not even I think you. I think that's a that's a good uh, note to to send this out on. Um, where can people find you? Have you got your own podcast as well? You know, you know, everybody says, "Go, go, do a podcast, do a podcast," and you know, there, there's a hundred million reasons why I probably should have <laughs> a while back, and you get what I'm going with there. I don't know if I would have gotten that deal from Spotify, <laughs> but um, uh, I haven't, and I and I don't, and I don't know why because. Well, I, I can tell you, Nate, that when I do do a podcast, I want to take it in a little different direction than just MMA, MMA, MMA. I want to yeah. be motivational. I want to help people out. I want to talk about athletics overall. I, I want to be uh, uh, put my coach hat on, if you will, yeah. um, because I've had experience working with people and telling them stories about what I've gone through, good, bad, and indifferent. And I've had my ups and downs as anybody in life. And when I show that transparency to people, they go, whoa, holy shit. Like you should have, everything should be just perfect. Like it should just be brilliant. And no, it's not always. And like, wow, if, if that could happen to Goldie, then it's okay that it happened to me. Not it's like, oh, it could happen. No, it's okay that it happened to me. How do we get out of this? How do we do this together? So when I do a podcast, it'll be more like that. I have yeah. great relationship with all the fighters. Uh, on the same hand, it's like, I almost sometimes, but like, I don't want like, yeah, we would have great times and we would have laughs and it would be like you and I've been. Um, yeah. There would be some serious like, oh, what's up with this? What's that? And there was a controversy back in 77. And like, fuck <laughs> that. I'm not going to get into any of that with any of my fighter friends. Um, but we would have some good stuff. So we'll see. But uh, Instagram, it's uh, both Twitter and Instagram, Goldie on TV. Um, yeah. I'm into the BYB Extreme now. We just signed with big promotion BKB over in the UK. Now we're partnering. So I may be in your backyard doing some bare knuckle before you know it. We've got some UK fighters on our upcoming it. card. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's funny you say that. Again, here you go. This is Now, this is perfect to end on. You remember the epic fights between back in the day, Kimbo Slice and Dada 5000? Yes. Dada 5000 is the co-founder of BYB Extreme. Oh, Dada and I work okay. together now. No way. And back, yeah, and it's taken from those backyard brawls. And cool. now it's legitimate in the Trigon, which Triller's trying to steal with their triad, which is BS, but do what you're going to do. There's only one Trigon and we send Dada over. He's going to kick your ass. But yeah, <laughs> to talk about Kimbo and Dada, um, Dada 5000 is one of the co-founders of BYB Extreme, who I'm working wow. for now. So there you go. Wrapped up in a beautiful package for us. That's insane. That, well, yeah, 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 that's it. That's good. Um, yeah, well, if you're ever in this neck of the woods, I'm in London. So okay. um, obviously you'll probably be coming down to the capital. Um, definitely hit me up. We've got each other's Love emails them. now. So um, uh, yeah. if you want to hang about with someone younger, I don't know. Um, maybe I might cramp your style. <laughs> nah, not at all. You make me feel good about myself. My, yeah, uh, especially my wife. Robert yeah. Jr. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. Which I, which I looked up on Wiki. Uh, we're pretty much the same age. Pretty much the same age. Um, and uh, Fernanda, my wife now, is a bit younger than me, about 24 years younger than me, and uh, almost 25. Michael Douglas, Kat, Kat Zones, I see, that was Prodigy. Michael Douglas and Catherine Zeta Jones are exactly 25 years apart. Exactly. They have the same birthday, 25 years apart. 
Fernando and I are about 24 years, 11 months and some change. And I love Gordon Gecko. I love me some Gordon Gecko. Like, come on, Wall Street, Michael. Do well, he kind yeah. of pisses me off because he wins by just a couple <laughs> yeah. of days, but he wins. Uh, but when I was first started dating Fernando, like Brucey was the best at it. He's like, ah, you brought the babysitter again. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> epic. Like, good job. Like, oh, oh, you're just, oh, is that one of your daughter's friends? Like, okay, easy. Like, Brucey, Brucey, like, you're down, bro. Like, come on. Um, <laughs> but we're, we're great together. So yeah, I, I can, I can still hang a little bit, Nate. And I love the UK. I love the passion of the fans there. London mm. is one of my favorite cities in the world. I remember the first time I went, I went, whoa, there's the London Eye. There's Big Ben. There's a house of parliament. There's, well, it's like in one little fucking square. Like where, where else <laughs> are we going to go? <laughs> and we found other things to do, but for us who have never been there for you, you, you obviously grew up there. But if, if you think about it, it is like, oh, Westminster. At, what's the next stop on the double decker bus tour? Where do we go now? <laughs> well, whenever you do come over, I'll take you to a few Irish bars that are located. There you go. And yeah. I'll get you some jammies. <laughs> that works for me. We will definitely do some jammies for sure. For sure. Um, for us finishing, can you please send this out on your catchphrase? Of course. Of course. I'm trying to think about the best way to do it what's your last name langton langton i yeah. for my partner nate langton this is mike goldberg saying so long until next time we see you right back here on the shit talk and banter podcast it is all over just like <laughs> that wow that was amazing mike thank you so much for this thank you nate. thank you